Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our live stream discussion for Theater Huntsville here at the Studio Theater at Low Mill Arts and Entertainment. We're really excited to have you all join us today. And we, ha we have with us um, Bertie Jones, uh, our production manager here at Theater Huntsville. We have Paul Hello. Nixon from Oakwood University. And we have Mark Moore, who has done direction and acting for us. Would you guys like to take a few moments to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, my name is Bertie Jones. Like she said, I'm the production manager here at Theater Huntsville. I also do stage management, lighting design, fight choreography, and uh, I occasionally write and do that sort of thing. So that's me. Tag you're it. <laughs> uh, my name is Paul Nixon. I am a professor in the Department of English and Foreign Languages at Oakwood University. It's a mouthful. Um, I'm the director of our new performance concentration in the English department where we do stage stuff, put plays on um, every year so far. So. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. And I'm Mark Moore. I work with Thrive Alabama, uh, the Director of Development and Marketing. And then for Theater Huntsville, I've directed a, a few shows, musicals here and there, and I'm glad to be here. All right. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I wanted to bring up is why we decided to do this panel discussion. Theater Huntsville is doing a series called Stories by Ghostlight. You may have seen some of those stories on YouTube. We have two of them up and two more are coming later this month. Um, as we were reviewing those stories, we, we entered, we encountered some race issues that Bertie and I were discussing and it kind of prompted this whole idea of having this discussion. Bertie, you want to tell us a little bit about that process and how we got here? Sure. So I was reading through, I was looking specifically for stories that were Alabama ghost stories. That was kind of my parameter for the production. And so as I started to dig, dig into them, a lot of them were Civil War era stories that had to do uh, had to do with slavery, the Confederacy, you know, the Home Guard. A lot of these really, really sticky issues, and I kept looking, running into them, and I was I was looking, going, you know, some of these things I think might be stories worth telling, especially given the Black Lives Matter movement. And some of them, I was like, I, I, I was having trouble being like, no, that's the message we want to. That has a, a is a message that has value. Um, so what I ended up doing was, uh, at the advice of a friend of mine, who's a rhetoric professor at Purdue, um, he said, well, why don't you go get a sensitivity reader? Um, and a sensitivity reader sometimes is someone that you pay to kind of do the emotional labor of reading difficult material. And, uh, what I ended up doing was, uh, I knew Mark Moore. I had seen his Facebook page and knew that he was not shy and in fact enjoyed, having sticky conversations and that it wouldn't be emotional labor for you. Um, so I grabbed you and said, Hey, Mark, <laughs> read these and tell me, uh, tell me what you think. So, uh, and that kind of prompted the discussion. And then as, as, uh, the discussion bore out, we were like, well, let's talk about this, uh, talk about what we did. Right. So Mark, what was that process like for you as a sensitivity reader? Well, sure. Um, you know, first I was flattered and honored to be asked to participate and you're right. Um, I'm one the type of person who is open to talking about the difficult things because I think that's how we move forward and how we have improvement. Um, and so when I first read them, you know, I think um, I had instant feelings about them. And one I thought was just a boring piece. She, she gave me four pieces to read. One, I was like, ooh, that's problematic. And I was like, ooh, that's a little problematic. And then the fourth, I said, Wow, I love this story. One, because it's the, the one that I read, uh, The Face in the Courthouse Window, because I had been to that actual location, so I was already familiar with the ghost story. And I thought it was great because it actually um, connected to what we're dealing with as far as Black people being accused wrongly and punished for a crime. So I thought it was just a really good fit. Uh, so when we talked, I said, hey... Um, this other one that we looked at, I think is a little problematic and here's why. And Bertie said, Oh, wow. That's something I wouldn't have thought of. And I said, 100%. Right. And that's what happens. There's times that I run into things and it has to be someone from another experience that says, Hey, this is why this is problematic. So I was appreciative. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> Paul, can you weigh in with your perspective on that and how these um, themes and literature have changed throughout time? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, as a, as a professor of literature, I've you know, done a lot of study with, with this particular thing and the kind of stories we should and should not read and the kind of things we should and should not expose our students to. And um, I'm a little torn on, and I'm, I'm really curious, actually, I'm going to ask you in a second, Mark, if I'm allowed to ask a question, um, what the problematic thing was in the story that you said we shouldn't read, because I, I really kind of want to know what that is. But um, I'm a little torn because, because for me, I believe that 
um, James Baldwin said, we can't change, I'm paraphrasing, we can't change everything, right? But we can't change anything until we face it, right? So we have to face the thing that we want to change. So for me, it's, it's a little bit of both. Like, do we want to, do we want to expose our students to problematic material intentionally in the safe context of the classroom and say, this is why this is problematic, right? Or do we want to leave them to the wolves and say, going, you know, they're going to encounter it anyway. It's out there, right? They're going to encounter it at some point in some way. Do we say, you know, go read whatever it is, Huck Finn, for example, go read it on your own or don't read it, right? But they're, they're going to encounter it. And then they have to interpret it themselves. So for me, it's a little bit of both. Like, like how do we, how do we know what to, what to block and what to show? You know what I mean? So, sure. so it's, it's a sticky issue and there's no simple answer. Um, but I am, I am, I am curious to know what sure. that, that material was. So, um, you know, this whole uh, production of reading these ghost stories is purely for entertainment. So when I read one of them, it had a Confederate uh, soldier who was, um, Treated, you know, in just too much like a hero to me to be used in this context. I thought, I'm not sure if that's the message that TH needs to send out in the midst of everything that's happening in 2020, especially. Then the other one um, was really much more subtle. It, it, at first, it probably seemed very, um, you know, not a problem, but it was talking about uh, people moving down to sell cotton uh, based on the slave labor. And I just was kind of like, okay, where's the entertainment value in this for, for what's happening here? Um, again, in the, in, in, the, in the context of what's happening in 2020. Whereas the one that was, um, that we actually went with, the, sl the face in the courthouse window, even though that's traumatic, there's a real parallel and there's a real lesson of this person was wrongly accused and wrongly murdered. And, you know, there's no apology written into it. Everything else seemed just too apologetic as it was going on. So that was it. And I would, I would say, having not read the stories, I would say based on an explanation, I probably agree with your decision. I, I think that's probably, um, I don't know if there is a right choice, but that's probably, you know. And I love what you said. I, I don't believe in, in protecting people from things that are, that are, in, you know, in media and being read. Um, in general, like you mentioned Huck Finn, I, you know, I think it has language that makes some people uncomfortable, but it's also, that was the time that it was written. And that's, and, and sometimes language is uncomfortable. Stories are uncomfortable because you're describing an uncomfortable situation. But for what this particular, um, project was, I didn't feel they were appropriate. Well, thank you guys. Um, bringing the discussion back to the theme of horror and horror as a genre, that was one thing Bertie and I discussed, like what makes something horror? What is horror? And can horror appear in, you know, media, literature, plays, movies, television that might not classically be described as horror, but does have horror elements? I'd love for you all to weigh in on that question. Um, well, uh, Actually, in our initial conversation, Paul, uh, when we were talking on the phone, um, and I kind of first was pitching this, uh, the idea of this discussion to you, we, um, you broached an interesting subject with me. You said, well, what defines horror? And I, I really wish you could have seen my face because I'm pretty sure I had like the buffering symbol behind my eyes. So I was just <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, but I gave, I did kind of think about it a little bit, especially in the context of the short story you suggested to me, the lynching of uh, Jude Benson. Um, and it's, um, I think what makes horror, like something to be classified as horror and you put it on the horror shelf in the bookstore, um, is kind of the intent with which it's written. Cause something can be horrific, but that, you know, the, the horror of it is not necessarily the, um, uh, the intent, the full intention behind it. Um, and like with the lynching of Jude Benson, depending on who you are, um, the horrificness of that story is going to hit differently. So that's kind of, that's my two cents. And I would, and I would um, co-sign that um, hundred percent. Actually, that's the word I have written here in my notes is intent. And um, I think that's really the key. And it's like with a lot of, a lot of art, actually, what, what did the, what did the artist mean to do? And then we determine whether or not it's good or, or quality based on whether or not they were successful in doing what they tried to do. So I think horror as a genre is, largely dependent upon the intent of the writer. So that story, for example, the lynching of Jude Benson uh, by uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, 
that would not be classified as a horror story. He wasn't trying to tell it, or he wasn't trying to scare you, right? But a horror story is intending to try to scare you or shock you or even gross you out sometimes, you know, and that's kind of the point of the story. Um, so, so I, I agree with you, Bertie. I think there's definitely elements of horror or horrific elements rather in other genres, but to be a horror story, I think the writer or the, the creator has to be trying to scare you, which, um, is an interesting goal for a, <laughs> for a creator. But being scared is fun, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and luckily in media, it can also be, um, educational. It can tell a story, it can bring about change. Uh, and then when it comes to movies and media, um, you know, horror doesn't, it, it isn't, you know, just in a box. Is this thriller a horror? Is this sci-fi thing or horror? So, um, cause we're going to talk about Get Out later. And there was lots of talk when it first came out about how it's being labeled, you know, um, and, and later on, I thought this is horrific in a way that people weren't expecting. So. Yeah, I can't wait till we talk about that film later. It's one of my favorites. Um, but, uh, kicking back to horror being in different, um, pieces of media, you know, we talked about how facing the court house, house window, has this element of horror because of a man wrongly accused. And that brought to mind for me, um, theater Huntsville has done To Kill a Mockingbird many times. And uh, the new, the modern version um, by Aaron Sorkin, is that correct? Um, there's a quote in there that I really thought was interesting that has some controversy. It's when horror comes to supper, it comes dressed exactly like a Christian. I'm curious if any of you have um, thoughts on that addition to the play or its context there. I can speak because I actually saw the play live on, on a uh, Broadway um, that um, there were some horror elements to that. And they were really honestly aimed directly at uh, honestly, directly at white people. It was very much a, this is not quaint. This is not um, a thing that is past. This is still something you should be very, very afraid of. This is not something that your grandparents dealt, you know, dealt with and it's over. Um, and it, I really feel like the way that Sorkin wrote it versus the version that we did here at Theater Huntsville, the difference very much was this is how the story would be told if it were written in, I don't know when it was written, 2018, 2016, something like that. Um, because like when they did, there's a, the scene when the, um, the lynch mob comes to the courthouse. Um, they actually, the courthouse, they actually entered from the audience. They were wearing like torn burlap sacks over their faces, carrying weapons, shining the light. Like they were looking for who they were looking for out in the audience. It was absolutely chilling. And there was not a bit of oxygen in that room. We, you know, we all just sucked in our breath. Um, and, that that was kind of an injury, you know, because then you you know in the back of your head, you know, those people take off their hoods and go to work and raise their families, and you know, in the case that the 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 incendiary quote is trying to make is those people go to church on Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, they did and they do. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna preface my statement by saying I haven't seen the Aaron Sorkin version, and it's also great. that I'm a Christian, I'm a practicing Christian. I 100% agree with that quote, that <laughs> the idea that very often um, the horrible things we do to get to each other as citizens in the world are masked behind whatever religion we are in the, in the, in the, in the West and the United States often it's Christianity. And um, a lot of times we use our, I'm just going to talk about Christianity because that's the one I belong to. A lot of times we use our Christianity as a divider when that's not the goal of the religion that the, really the religion is supposed to bring people together so we use it a lot of times to say not them but us and that's the opposite of the goal and it's, it's a misuse so it's very often used that way though so I, I would definitely agree with aaron sorkin saying that you know it thinks uh, you know i'm i'm not christian but the parallel that it draws to me is kindness there's times when when something horrific happens and the person who committed that that horrific thing, they say, oh, but they were so nice or they were so kind to me. Um, and that doesn't negate the fact that they were horrible and evil to someone else. Um, I've had people, especially in this political time that we're in now, try and describe some politicians because they are polite, they're kind, they're, they're well-spoken. And I'll say, but I'm looking at what they're voting for and how they're acting because what they're doing is a detriment to other people. 
So yes, they are nice and, and polite and kind and using great words and probably a joy to be at a party with. But at the end of the day, what they're doing is horrific. And so I think that, so that quote to me is saying that don't be fooled by what the expectation should be. So the expectation is that as a Christian, they should be unifying, um, helping others, treating their neighbor a certain way. But unfortunately, um, evil is pervasive and it affects people throughout history and throughout every religion, every culture, so that there are bad guys everywhere. So this segues in a different direction than I planned, but that really segues great to get out, right? Because that's everything in that film, right? We see this veneer of kindness that is covering up the sinister underbelly. It gets really deep. I know uh, Bertie has talked about social anxiety being a big part of this race issues and fear of the other and horror. So as long as we're on that, let's let's go ahead and talk about Get Out, Mark. You, so you've all seen that film? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd love to hear all your thoughts on that film, um, it's in particular regards to that theme. I loved that movie so much. Um, it was just unexpected. Um, and I went to see it with a friend of mine who's white, um, Carl Bumbright. And at some point during, but the audience was primarily African-American. And at some point during the media, movie, uh, I don't remember exactly what happened, but something happened and the audience reacted to it. And, and he looked at me and he goes, so is that a thing? Does that really happen? Is that how black people perceive, you know, that, that, that happened? And I said, absolutely. And that's what it was doing. It was taking, um, these, these things that are regular in, in African American life and how we interact with white people, be it the police or in you know, relationships and those parents and, um, class differences, because that's also what's present in this movie. Um, and, and then switching it. And then the twist of the movie, oh my gosh, you know, did that, it harkened back to a time past and it twisted things so beautifully. Um, and that's what made it scary. You know, it's not the movies that have gruesomeness and blood and stuff like that have been the ones that have really, really made me afraid is movies like Silence of the Lambs, because that could really happen. Even though Get Out had this uh, science fiction kind of twist to it, the motivation in it was real, you know, so that's what made it um, truly, truly scary to me. Yeah, I, I love that movie, too. And um, I'm not to just be 100 percent with everybody i'm not like the hugest fan of horror because for me being scared isn't the most fun thing so, <laughs> so i'm with you actually <laughs> yeah but um but get out was a spectacular movie in my opinion and and um one of the things that really stood out to me from the, I, I think i've only seen it twice i don't think i saw it but anyway one of the things that really stood out to me was um just the issue of marginalization right so so the sunken place represents just being silenced and that's a place where african americans as a community have been period you know since african-american has been a thing you know push to the margin silence get out of my get out of my face and be quiet shut up and dribble whatever it is right so so get out just does such a great job of making the protagonist the one who is marginalized so not everybody can you can't not see it right you cannot not see it in that film because it's the main character of the show i mean the movie um and then another thing that stood out to me was that um, Jordan Peele, and he's done it again with um, Lovecraft Country. I don't know if that's where we're going next, but oh, yeah. <laughs> Lovecraft Country, which um, show on HBO, and, and um, actually the season finale comes out tonight, so it's it's not over yet. But what he's done with with those two works in particular is there's there's supernatural elements and there's scary stuff in the in the in the in the story, but the antagonist is racism, right? So so in both those cases, you have black people using the scary stuff to overcome the real antagonist in, in both Lovecraft Country and Get Out that happens. You know, you, you have monsters or whatever and black people work together with the monsters or you have ghosts and you have black people work together with the ghosts to overcome the racist. And it, he's really showing how racism is really more horrible to black people than even supernatural stuff is, you know, and it's just, it's such a, it's such a, just a brilliant way of, of, of storytelling. And I really, I really enjoy it, even though it's scary. And you remember in Get Out how uh, you know, it's been out long enough, so I, there's no worry about spoilers. Um, spoilers. Right. But how the father, you know, was so chummy and was like, I voted for Obama and this, that, and the other. And he, and, and well, so welcoming, yet he's the bad guy. Right. The, you know, um, everyone was so polite. Again, there's back to that politeness. 
And yet again, there was all this, you know, underbelly of, of, of evil. And, and so again, and Lovecraft, we should point out, um, I can't remember her name, but he's the, I think the executive producer. Nisha but, Green. But the, the creator is a, is a black woman. And so I'm just, I'm so excited to see, um, blacks have a role in these genres that we have been closed out of before. And we're seeing it more in superhero movies. Uh, we've got, uh, Regina, who just did Watchmen, which also touched on, you know, Tulsa, the first episode of that, which was again, I had people come up to me on Facebook and say, is that real? Did that really happen in America? I'm like, yes, in multiple cities. And so, more than once, actually, you know, and, 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 and again, it is, it's like we're using, um, these, these genres of, of action movies and superheroes and horror to, um, to bring out some real important knowledge that we need to have as a, as a country. And she is now going to do a new TV, a, a new movie or TV show with um, an African-American uh, lead female young person where she, you know, is, is also going to be a horror type of genre, superior type of genre. So I'm just loving seeing these That's creative exciting. people finding their voice. Um, you're talking about like, you know, how, how things feel versus, um, you know, and they, they go to these supernatural places with it, but it's like the reality of it is more horrifying than any sort of, um, any sort of, uh, supernaturalness can say. There's a writer named Victor Laval who, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, uh, the difference between journalism is, and fiction is that journalism tells you what happened. Fiction tells you how it felt. And I, I appreciate movies like Get Out because while they do sort of, prey on my own anxieties as a white person where it's like, you know, well, we've all been at the supper table, you know, whether it's with friends or family or whatever. And somebody has said something just, just that much off, just that much, not really, but it's, you know, and, and you just have to be like, Oh God, I, you know, and, and then to get ha to have a movie like get out that gives us a window beyond like, you no, know, this, what you've seen at the dinner table is the window into this whole world of issues. And that's what I appreciated it for, even though it freaked the crap out of me. And then of course, don't forget the end of the movie where you think he is finally, he's finally safe. And then you see the police car pull up and all of our collective hearts sunk. Yeah. We, because it's a horror movie. So you're thinking it's going to end bad and you see that. And then, you know, police br brutality, we're talking about a lot in 2020, but it's not new. No. And, you know, that Get Out came out years ago, and we all had a feeling when we saw that cop car, we just groaned because what Which is Which I think name? back then, I would, I would not have. I actually only watched it recently, and I don't think, uh, I don't think then when it came out, I would have had the, ooh, you know, I probably would now. Yeah. But I didn't then. Yeah. Or See, wouldn't have then. Right. I saw it with my, my wife and my brother and his wife, and, um, at the end of the movie, like you described, at the end of the movie, all of us are like, it's a horror movie, so we're kind of on edge, but we, we, you feel like it's over, but you know it's not over, right? You hear the sirens, and my wife was like, I knew it. <laughs> she said it out loud. She's like, I knew it. And she was like, I knew it wasn't over. So, I mean, that's just, that just encapsulates what we all, we're all like, oh man, it's too good to be true. There's no way we win. Like, that's, that, that, this isn't the story we've, we've been, we've been told. This isn't the story we've lived, you know? I thought there was even, um, you mentioned the sunken place. I thought there was like a, even a subtler horror theme of, you know, these captors using the talents and abilities of these people that they've sent to the sunken place. And it brought to mind, you know, all the, you know, black contributions to like our society that have been sent into a, you know, sunken place, so to, so to speak. And that's a element of horror that's really interesting. And, you know, I know uh, Paul and Bertie, you say you're not fans of horror. And I think, you know, there's a difference between, you know, that kind of existential horror that deals with issues. I have a friend that calls it comfy horror because we live with it um, versus like the jump scares and the blood and the gore and all that. There's almost, you know, one has like a poetry and a literary element to it while the other is just like a, a carnival ride scare house. So, yeah, I'm always I'm interested in in horror, particularly as as a, as a way that it expresses social anxiety. I mean, it's, you know, um Lovecraft did it, um, horrible racist that he was. Um, but the, it, it's, uh, there, there's, you know, the game Silent Hill has, you know, they, 
they talk a lot in that, in those games, it's all around uh, anxieties about um, families and families put together in, in strange ways and, you know, uh, anxieties about adopting children or versus, you know, uh, versus having them naturally. And there's this whole thing with that. And I really appreciate that about horror and its way of, um, of, of just discussing of being a way to talk about social anxiety without actually talking about it, talk about, you know, the way it feels, not the reality. You know, you mentioned the sunken place and it, it, at least in my world on social media, we use the sunken place to describe a state of being in the real world. When, when people have, um, I guess maybe sold out, maybe the kind of best way to describe it or are deeply misguided and confused when we feel it's like people that shouldn't be. Um, that's how we'll describe them. We'll say, well, they, they're in the second place because they're not acting in their own best interest. They're definitely not acting in the best interest of the community. Um, and so it's interesting that that came out of that movie. And, um, you mentioned, um, how in the movie it was about taking black excellence and co-opting it. Mm -hmm. And how often have we heard people talk about actors and musicians and athletes who are black trying to talk about real issue and people saying, just play ball. You're being paid to do this. Don't talk about this politics. We don't need to hear from you. Elvis invented rock and roll. Right. All of that stuff. And it's kind of like, no, we're, this is, they're living a life too. And all it takes is being, you know, not recognized and they're in as much peril as anyone else. That's what, that's what I don't want to derail the conversation, but that's what Ice Cube is dealing with right now. Um, I'm not taking a position on what he did or what he didn't do, but, but his, the reaction he's getting on, on, in, on, um, social media is basically go entertain us. Right. And you shouldn't be involved in politics at all. And that's just kind of a normal reaction. And it's unfortunate that it's normal, but um, it is, it is pretty normal. You know? All right. Lovecraft country. Um, before we get to the show, which is the whole discussion in itself, I want to talk a little about, about um, HP Lovecraft himself. I've been a big fan of his stories. Um, of course he is, was a terrible racist and anti-Semite. I'm a Jew. So I definitely feel that. Um, I love that in the show, they address that right away when Tick has that conversation with the, with the passenger. So um, great. Oh, it's so great. And, and, and it was funny. It kind of harkens back to the, some of the stories you found um, problematic from the Wyndham books about this Confederate hero. And he has this pulp science fiction Confederate hero. And they're, you know, talking about, is it okay to appreciate literature written by or that you know, a racist author or that features a racist hero um, he calls them, I think he calls them his problematic faves. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit like what, what are your feelings on appreciating work that is written by a racist author or features a racist character? Um, you know, we're going to see, we're going to have to deal with this as a culture and as uh, people who enjoy media more than ever from now on, because the eye is on everything. Um, how many people are wrought up about JK Rowling right now? You know, Yikes. um, but at the end of the day, if Harry Potter brought you through your teenage years and improved your life, it still did. And, and she's still alive. So there's still time for her to correct her path, you know, um, Praise God. You, and, and, and for someone like, I, I had a friend that was talking about, um, that and, and the person said Ender's Game is one of her favorite books. Oh, yeah. And then I, that, that author apparently is like pretty horrific. I'm not familiar with him, but you know, that was the deal. So I think you can separate, um, the work from the creator, you know, Cosby show, still enjoyable, still love all of those other actors. Bill Cosby in his own way was a genius. Doesn't separate the fact that he was horrible and did some horrible things. Um, what was the other show with, with the, uh, is it Family Tie? No, uh, uh, the one where the, the dad was a preacher and, um, he ended up doing all sorts of things and I can't remember it now, but it's another, there's, it happens. Sure. These, the, these people commit these horrible, um, things in real life, but the work that they did in entertainment, is still transformative and important. Um, Michael Jackson, you know, I, I don't think anyone can dispute what he has done for music 
Um, and, but his legacy, you know, tarnished. So uh, that's just how I am with it all. It's kind of like you have to be able to separate the work from the person. And I, and I agree with that. The show you're talking about is Seventh Heaven. That's it, Seventh Heaven. Yeah. Um, what my wife just texted me. Thanks, Ty. So, um, <laughs> cause I didn't know either. Uh, <laughs> but I, but, uh, but I, I agree with you 100%. To an, to an extent, to an extent, you have to separate the work from the worker to an extent, right? Because, because again, the Cosby show is a great example. You know, we found out what Bill Cosby had been doing for all these years. I was an adult. Like I watched the Cosby show when I was a little kid. I can't go back and undo my childhood. It doesn't wow. even make sense. Like that's even, that's a ridiculous thought. You know, as a matter of fact, growing up, my parents wouldn't, we wouldn't, we weren't allowed to watch TV um, during the school week. My parents would not let us watch TV because we had to be in school and they knew we'd, we'd go too far with it. There was one show we were allowed to watch Thursday night at eight o'clock. The whole family sat around the table, turned on TV and watched Cosby show. And then a couple of years later, a different world came out. And then our 30 minutes of TV became an hour. Yep. And that was it. That was, the, we had an hour of TV during you know, Saturday night and Sunday is different, but Monday through Friday, no, nah, we ain't doing it. So, so Bill Cosby's horrific and horrible, horrible things that he did, it does not invalidate my experience with his work. Right. So I think, so I think, I think we should be careful to separate those two things and, and absolutely. Um, you know, he deserves what he whatever he gets in terms of the law. But does that mean he, we should take a show off the TV? I don't know. Plus, we we forget how important the Cosby Show, Different World, was to Black people in that time span yeah. mm -hmm. because it showed two successful parents, um, this house full of kids. Everyone's just striving and successful. And before that, we hadn't seen it. And, um, that's important. Just like when, you know, we move from seeing the occasional gay character to having Will and Grace. Um, you know, those things are important and, and, and it doesn't change once we discover that the creator or the actor, um, is bad. Um, a, another example of that that I would give that's in, in the horror area is actually Silence of the Lambs. We were talking about it. Um, when that book was written and when that show came out, it was interesting and revolutionary in terms of uh, women in the workforce, especially women in law enforcement. Um, you know, Clarice Starling was, you know, the whole thing is shot very much like what it, what it was like to be um, a woman in a man's workplace and a predominantly men's workplace. Um, but then on top of, you know, and it is still to, to this day, one of my favorite, uh, it's my favorite movie ever. Um, but it has some really problematic representations of trans people. Um, and it's interesting, and this kind of folds us back to Lovecraft Country. It's inter it was interesting to see Brian Fuller go and get, he never made it all the way to Silence of the Lambs, but to go and get the ideas and the characters and the, um, the messages of the, the Hannibal Lecter series and say, bring them into the modern era. And make them, I want to say, make, make them less problematic and make them much more positive. You know, he had gay characters. He added more women, added people of color. Um, all of that was, you know, it was much more diverse. It was much more even handed. And, you know, and he very much acknowledged. He said, yeah, you know, the original, uh, the original material was very, very problematic. And, but I, you know, I still think it's a story worth telling. I think that that's why, you know, why we get stuff like Lovecraft Country, like that. That, um, you know, the Lovecraft mythos, even though the social anxiety it was born out of was one of the most horrifically racist people to ever walk the earth, honestly. <laughs> if you've ever never, never read any of his per per personal writings, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Even in his stories, there's yeah. even there are some stories. things like I've been listening to the audiobook and I was in the car alone and I'm like, I'm really glad nobody else is in the car, a car with me right now. Um, and that's one thing where, you know, it comes through in his work where like say in, in Cosby show or something, it didn't come through in his work. Um, and it, it, it is problematic. I've always felt that because he was so xenophobic, he was able to kind of break a terror barrier in the genre of literature that didn't, wasn't, maybe couldn't have been broken without that, that just extreme xenophobia and deeply troubled psyche that he had. And we're happy um, to have the Legos and thank you. And we'll, we'll go play with them <laughs> on our own. I, I love, so one of the most problematic stories he wrote was um, Herbert West Reanimator. I don't know if any of you have read that. It's terrible. Yikes. And they allude to it at the beginning of the show. Um, Tick goes into the, the shop and, and he's told about Lovecraft Country. And he's like, isn't that where Herbert West and Herbert West Reanimator was from? And if you have read that story, I mean, that reference doesn't get lost on you because in the story, 
um, there's this, you know, mad scientist, you know, Dr. Frankenstein type, and he reanimates corpses. And one of the corpses he reanimates is of a black man. And the descriptions are just unbelievably terrible. Um, there's a reason probably like even for the time. Unbelievably oh, terrible. unbelievably terrible. And so, yeah, there's a reason we don't hear about that story much, but the, I really appreciate that they, they made that reference in the show. So, um, moving on to that, the, the show itself, you know, uh, the themes, how it's been handled. Um, the idea again, the, the book, I think the original book was written by a white author, but the, um, the show is directed by a black woman. Um, mm -hmm. love to hear your thoughts on the show so far and I'll just leave it to you. So, um, I've, I've watched all of the episodes so far. And like I said before, I'm, I'm plugging an HBO show that I have nothing to do with, but <laughs> the season finale is on tonight. And if you're, if you're into scary stuff at all, I recommend you go watch it. Um, there are, there are supernatural elements. There's scary stuff in it. So if you're not into scary stuff, it will scare you. Keep that in mind. But I will say this for me, I knew it was a horror show. And I, and, and to be honest, I had decided not to watch it. And, Sorry. and then, and then, and then Birdie invited, we, you know, we talked about doing this and she mentioned Lovecraft Country and I was like, all right, I guess I'll watch it. And, and I talked to my brother who has seen it and he was like, yeah, you definitely want to watch it. And then I talked to my sister who has seen it and she was like, yeah, you definitely want to watch it. I was like, okay, so I'll watch it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talked me into it. So anyway, I, so I knew it was a horror show, right? I'm, I'm 20, 30 minutes into the first episode of the show and I already feel like this is a horror show and nothing supernatural has happened yet. Right. The only thing that's happening in the show at the time is there's black people living in the six, in the fifties. That's it. Black Americans in the fifties. That's that's all that's happening. And I'm like, this is horrible. This is a horror. This is a great. This is a great representation of horror. And nothing supernatural had happened at all. And and it's it's really um it kind of fits in with what they're trying to do. They're, they're really trying to cast racism as the horror, right? And not not the supernatural elements. So for me, that was that just really really it stood out to me. And and um. For me, it's the thing that is most um, valuable, maybe. I don't know if that's the right word. Effective, useful, I don't know. But for me, that's the thing that stands out, I guess, the most about the show is, is, is that, that, that horror element in spite of the supernatural stuff. Well, the, um, we were watching it, I think, uh, the first episode on a Friday night, curled up watching TV with the dogs. And I didn't know much about it. Um, so I'm watching, I'm going, oh, this is beautiful. Like it's a beautifully shot show and the actors are just home run. They're just giving it to us again. This was just probably what two months ago that I watched this first episode and we're in 2020. We're dealing with the pandemic. We're dealing with police brutality. We're dealing with all of those stresses, stressors. And I'm watching this show. And it's talking about the Green Book and about Sunset Cities. And for those of you who don't know, a Sunset City is, is a, a, or a county, Sunset County, is where you're in a county and the white people have made it very clear that if you're black, you don't need to be out after sunset. Um, and we, we have those in Alabama. And so it's like this, there's that, that realism that is horrific. And I'm, and I'm feeling a certain way and I'm, I'm going, wow, this is really, you're right. Before anything su uh, uh, supernatural happened, this thing has already got me on edge. And then we watched it. And then once the, the monsters came out, they really weren't that scary. <laughs> the monsters weren't that bad. They, they really weren't that scary. <laughs> weren't that and I'm like, oh, they're kind of gross. Cool. I can but, hit that with a stick. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but key into that was how the, um, the protagonist reacted to the monsters is different than the normal tropes in science fiction. So again, and horror. So, so that was awesome. After it was over, I was in a bad mood for about three days because the thing that was horrible was the fact that these people live in their life, doing their thing, not in their business, are moving through the world in danger from people in power who are white. And I felt a way about it. And I said, okay, I said, this is a brilliant show. I cannot wait to finish it. I'll finish it in 2021 or 2022. And, and, and I'm okay with that. And it's kind of like, oh, this is so, I'm so happy for, uh, for these actors. Um, they're just, and I'm, and I'm, because again, the world that we have, 
with social media, I get glimpses of things that happen. I see a little snippet here and I'm still seeing things in newer episodes and going, this is brilliant. I'm going to wait to watch the episode until I'm in a certain mindset because it's just that good and it's just that scary, but for not the reasons that it would be scary to someone else. Yeah, I'm a binger. I'm waiting to watch it all in one, one sitting. I've seen the first uh, two episodes, but uh, you talking about the, uh, you know, this is, this takes, you know, it takes place back in the, is it the 50s, 60s? Um, but uh, it, it's interesting to me, uh, something similar happens in uh, the show Umbrella Academy. Um, and, and there's kind of a horror yes. moment where they, uh, the troop gets sent back in time and, it's kind of groovy. You see like all the white siblings like off doing their thing, running around in, you know, 1960s, wherever. And then all of a sudden the, um, the, the black woman wa runs into a, um, a cafe and she's trying to get help. And you can tell everybody's just looking at her with this unbridled malevolence. And finally she looks up and you see, and you know, it didn't, I, I am sure that if I wasn't white, it would not have occurred to me of just like, Oh girl, do not go in the, do, do not go in the restaurant right now. Check the check the sign at the door first. Um, Plus, but she came from the future, right? She know? came from the future. But yeah. I feel like as an audience member, like the audience, and as an audience member, I I th that was probably because it was shot in such a way where I should have picked up on it sooner. Or I could have picked up on it sooner. Um, had well, I been paying attention to it in the right mindset. <laughs> well, it's kind of like that old thing that, that we sometimes joke about where you walk into a room and if you're black, you instantly know if you're the only black person there. Um, women, I'm sure there are times that your extra senses are surveying the surroundings to determine what is safe and what is not. Um, that's kind of what happens. And if it's, if it's not your particular danger, then it's not top of mind. Um, it also makes me think of, you know, the Umbrella Academy specifically of how many times people would say, oh, what period of time would you go back to if you could? When would you go? And I've always looked, um, none. None. I'm not trying to go back. <laughs> I'm not going back. I'm not going back at all. <laughs> I, w I was actually just thinking about that with, uh, I feel like the specific social anxiety that the movie, I think it just came out called Antebellum. Mm -hmm. That's the, the horror of it is, um, a woman gets somehow sent back in time. She's a successful, you know, black businesswoman. She's very, very wealthy. And suddenly she gets sent back to the Antebellum South. And I, and it, that made me think of exactly that of, you know, every, you know, yeah, it, that's such a white people question. Uh, you know, <laughs> what time period would you like to go back to? To the twenties. Uh, um, yeah, no. I, I, I haven't seen Umbrella Academy. It's, it's, it's on my it's on my short list. I, I do plan to watch it. But you mentioned the um, diner scene, and it reminds me of the diner scene in, in Lovecraft Country. And I, I wrote it. I just wrote it in my notes. It just calls to mind a time when eating lunch in a diner was literally a life or death proposition. Right, you're putting your life on the line by walking into a diner and sitting down. Which is crazy. So, I mean, it's like, you know, what am I going back to? I'm not, mm -mm, no thanks. And, and that was not 100 years ago. Right, they're right. And, and that cool, was in this state. The cool thing about that was, you know, they were, um, they were creating the Green Book, which was the, the safe passage map for black people at that time. They had gone to that specific diner thinking it was a safe place, but it had been, you know, burned out and the, the owner had been pushed out and it was no longer a safe space. So again, that again goes to something that we just don't fully understand, just how dangerous it was to maneuver life in that time. Dangerous in a different way. Yeah, I really uh, appreciated that. We were talking about the Sundown Towns and the monster element in that show, you know, was also a monster that came out at night and it took this social anxiety tension that's there and it universalized it into a literal monster, which I thought was an interesting approach as well. I wanted to say that um, the idea of, of of living your life and and normal things being a life or death proposition is what I'm trying to say. That that hasn't totally gone away for for black people in America. It has not totally gone away. Um, I personally, I'm I'm relatively young. I'm uh, under sixty. Um, <laughs> so I, I personally have had experiences with authority figures, police officers in particular, not in the South, in the North, in, in Massachusetts and stuff like that, where harassed and, and all kind of stuff going on. And you're, you haven't done anything and you're afraid for your life sure. from authority figures that, I mean, in my lifetime. And it's like, that's, that's crazy. And then we, obviously the police brutality thing happening now. So it's like, it's, it's something that I think these shows and these, these movies that we're talking about, I think there's something that's bringing these issues to the forefront 
because some of us are aware of them, but not everybody is, right? And and, and, a, and a lot of people that I talk to say, wow, I had no idea, right? And, and you know, that's, of course, you wouldn't have an, any idea. That's not your experience, right? But but these shows are bringing it to the forefront so that you can have an idea and then we can, we can you know, do something with it. I talked to somebody recently, this is like maybe a week ago and um, or two weeks, and she said, she said, um, the, um, the stuff with, the stuff with, um, I can't remember the guy's name. Happy George Floyd. Thank you. <laughs> you helped me by just looking at me. The stuff with George Floyd and, and, and Breonna Taylor, like all these people, like she, she said, she said out loud and I quote, she said, I thought we were past this. And I said, I didn't. This is not, this is not a new issue for me. I, I was never at the point where I thought we were, we were past it. That didn't happen for me. So unfortunately, I'm not surprised when some of this stuff happens, but I'm glad it's being brought to light so that we can have a wider, you know, a wider view of what's actually going on in society. Well, years ago, I was driving um, on Spartan Drive and um, talking to my partner on the phone. Um, thank goodness for, you know, it's, what, what wonderful world we are in that technology. Because, you know, we're just talking through the car play. So, and I see the lights go off in my rear view mirror. And I said, oh, crap. There's, I'm being pulled over by a cop. And I'm, then I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm just making that turn. I'm like, you know. And as I pulled over, he said, stay on the phone. And first off, I was grateful because, again, this just as you're saying, this isn't new. This was several years ago. Um, but he was already aware, okay, we need to th we need to handle this together as best we can. I need to be a witness, a voice, you know, something in case this goes wrong. And it's not to, I think the other, I think sometimes when we talk about these real fears and anxieties with um, authority figures, law enforcement, et cetera, it's not demonizing all police. Of course. I have good friends that are police. Me too. It doesn't, but it, just like I have good friends that are white. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it doesn't negate the fact that some white people are dangerous, some police are dangerous to me as a black man uh, and as a black gay man on top of that. Um, so, you know, it was, again, it was a fine experience, but it was that real present fear. Just like you're talking about, you were up north doing it. That's the other thing that people think. They think the south and the north are so different. It's kind of like, this whole country's got a whole lot going on. Not always just black and white. We've got a whole lot of uh, shades of colors and differences in people. And there's just room for hate to go around. So, which is, again, sad. Um, I, it, the thing that sort of struck me is the fact that you, you know, good cops, bad cops, the, the problem is that, you know, you've felt the need to stay on the phone with your partner because you don't know. It's a roll of the dice. Mm -hmm. And, and that is something, I, yeah, I think, I think about it now, you know, I, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have thought of that about that. It's just a, a policeman getting out of the car. It would not be a roll of the dice to me. You know, now I think about it, it's like, oh, well, it would be, you know, if I were black. And then think about the fact that that the um, the Killer Mockingbird quote talking about the, the, the Christian. There is an expectation of a Christian to be good or a police officer to be good. And the fact that we now have to move through the world through, you know, discerning at every interaction. Is this person my friend or foe? Is that's the reality of what we're living in. And if you don't see that, then you're just, you're, you're missing something. And it's a, and, and the things, um, you know, it crosses, you know, I remember not understanding certain things until a, a, a female friend of mine described a situation and I said, Oh, this is that fear you're talking about that I experienced as a gay man going, am I going to be bashed going down this dark alley holding hands, you know, on my way to my car? Um, there's parallels through all of us. You know, when a, when a, when a church has, when a religious house is vandalized, the first question, is it a temple or a synagogue? Is it a mosque or is it a church? Who's attacking us now? And that, again, that's that horror in real life. And that's why this media is, um, I think, making such an impact now because it's tapping into something that we're really afraid of. We're not afraid of vampires and boogeymen. We're afraid of our 
our neighbors who aren't who they seem. Right. Who, who, who wear a nice normal face yeah. that, you know, teach Sunday school and go and, you know, run the corner store. Right. And that's always the importance of the arts and literature and all that in general, right? That's its role really. I mean, sometimes we just go to be entertained, but sometimes, you know, the real crux of it is getting it, to, getting us to address those things. Um, you know, referencing back to the Cosby show, you know, as somebody who was also kid in the eighties and watched that show. Um, and it did have that role, you know, of, Oh, let's normalize this happy, you know, black family that we never saw on TV before. But I also think it gave some of society and some of us who grew up during that time kind of a Pollyannish view. Um, because even when it would address that show would address like race issues, it was kind of this like softened network TV, you know, version of it. It wasn't going deep into that, you know, kind of thing that Get Out or Lovecraft Country does on a deeper level. Well, part of, you know, what it did for, at least for me as a black kid was showing the potential of what I could do. Oh, yeah. You know, um, but what I think it, something like that can potentially do that's negative is then set up a, um, a hierarchy of good black versus back, bad black, acceptable black. Um, I had someone recently very, it, he was being very kind. He was actually trying to do a good thing saying that he wished that some of his more close minded friends could hear from people like me and that person and that person, that black articulate intelligent person, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I get what you're saying. I said, but what we need to happen is at the end of the day, they need to look at all people for their value and worth and not set up in their mind this hierarchy of this intelligent black person versus this other black person. I, I totally agree with that. I feel that 100% because I'm I'm an English teacher and I have been for my whole career. So I, I speak really well, you know, <laughs> it's part of my job. Right, you know what right. I mean? So, so I'm seen a lot of times as, you know, one thing and not the other. Safe. Um, sa yeah, safe and all, all, all that kind of stuff. Another thing it does um, is sometimes it gives it gives the false view that we're past the issue. That, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we see Bill, we see um, Cliff Huxtable and Claire on TV and you have a black doctor, black lawyer who have been married and all their kids are within their marriage and they're still married and they're happy. Oh, okay. So you guys are good. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we, we don't need our help. Like, we, you know, we're, we're fine. Um, Barack Obama did the same thing. We elect a black president and, and we think we, I'm saying we as a culture, we as a society, we think that we're, we're, we're past the race issue, right? We think it's a post racial American. I remember reading stuff during, during that, um, during his presidency. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. You know, Th that's not that's not an indication that everyone is fixed right and here's a trophy we're done <laughs> yeah right exactly exactly and, and interestingly enough um jordan peele started writing get out during the obama presidency to address that issue right he wanted to say on screen we're not actually past the issue right it actually didn't come out until um trump was president came out in 2017 so he ended up changing the ending and stuff like that but but his his, his original goal part of his original goal in in making the film get out was was demonstrating through you know real life society in some ways that w this is not a post racial America you know um, so I think it, I can I can I think you can definitely cut both ways in terms of seeing success on TV. All right, well we're getting towards the end of the hour. I'd like to invite anybody on the live stream who wants to submit questions, please do so. Um, but looking ahead, we have two more ghost stories coming out. Stories by Ghost Light. Brody, can you tell us a little bit about the remaining two stories? Oh, I can, because this actually kind of dovetails back to our original point where we were talking about um, with, you know, getting a sensitivity reader, something that came out of that um, and kind of getting out of the comfort zone and being like, okay, we can't do this. So what are we going to do? And, and kind of being okay with that discomfort because I was really, you know, I was kind of ready and raring to go with the filming um, and, so that, you know, you being like, maybe you ought to think about something else. I went, okay, <laughs> so what are we going to do? Cause I don't, I, you know, I already called out a bunch of stuff that I was like, this is overtly a problem. You know, here are the ones that are the least problematic. Um, I, uh, but what that ended up giving us the opportunity to do and kind of one of the reasons I would encourage people to kind of just sit with that discomfort and be okay with that and understand change can come out of that because what ended up coming out of being like, well, you need two new ones was we got two brand new pieces of fiction. Um, one of which uh, was the story that you suggested uh, to me. And then I went and did a bunch of research and wrote up about it um, and learned a lot of interesting things about the home guard, the free state of Winston, like all of, you know, a lot of things about the civil war that I didn't know. 
um, things that happen with, you know, uh, there being uh, bands of vigilantes that would go around and round people up for Confederate service and things like that. I had no idea that that sort of thing happened. Um, so I got to write about that and, uh, and, and write about a ghost that was avenging that issue. Um, and the other one was, uh, so that's, uh, the story of Aunt Jenny, uh, from down in Winston County. And, uh, that one is coming out this coming weekend. And then the next one is, um, written by my good friend, Curtis Lindsay. Um, and it is actually a brand new ghost story because it's actually about his grandmother. It gave me the opportunity to go to someone and be like, Hey, do you know any good ghost stories? He was like, Oh my gosh, there's a story that my grandmother told me about the gamble house. It's called the gamble house. And it was about, you know, his, his grandmother, Margaret, who would go and spend the night there and hear footsteps in the dark and hear doors get, getting slammed closed and lights in the forest and the whole, the whole nine yard, whole haunted house, nine yards. Um, and so it was really great. So I like, I, I was in the end, even though it was stressful for me. And I, I understand that, you know, when, when we're looking at these programming decisions and we suddenly realize, you know, you, maybe you don't want to reach out for help because you don't want to be told, eh, maybe you should think about something else. I would encourage you like do it because you end up getting cool opportunities, um, cool opportunities for, in our case, new works. We ended up with two new stories that were written by local authors and that's in a way way more fun i think so that's what's coming up those those will be coming out uh saturday at midnight this coming saturday and on halloween Spooky. Mm. And I'm having, having, a, having a lot of fun editing those. And Bertie and I had fun going to some places in Alabama. We went to the courthouse and saw, saw the face, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, um, it was super freaky. We do have one question from the audience of, are we going to continue to do these talks for future productions that we do? I really would like to. Um, depending, you know, it'll depend on what, you know, what stories we're doing. Like, I know uh, if we end up doing, you know, Shakespeare, bring, bring some uh, Shakespeare professionals. Maybe if you want to come back and talk some Shakespeare. Sounds um, awesome. I love, uh, I love Shakespeare. The uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, the short version is yes, we would love to keep doing stuff like this. It's a lot of fun. That's one great thing that's come out of this pandemic. You know, looking at the silver lining, we haven't been able to do our normal productions, but it's caused us to think outside the box. You know, like you were saying, when one door closes, another opens, and so getting on Twitch and getting this set up, this has been great. So um, we're getting towards the end of the hour. Do any do any of you have any closing remarks um, before we wrap it up? I don't. Thank you guys so, so much. I just, I appreciate uh, being invited and being included. Um, and I love this kind of stuff. So I would love to continue to work with you guys and on other things. Like I said, we have a production concentration now in the English department at Oakwood. So we do, we do stage plays. I would love to work with you guys on something. Ooh, let's collaborate. That sounds great. And I'm excited to have met you. I think you're awesome. And it seems like you got a lot of um, nerd geek factor mixed in there too. So I like that. Um, I think that is a compliment. It, it is a total compliment. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I do hope Theater Hunts will continue with this. I think the response to the pandemic and being creative um, was just fantastic. When you reached out and said, hey, we're going to do this video series, I thought that's brilliant. And something I hope you do every year. And then also these talks. Um, I think talkbacks are good, especially if you're dealing with um, difficult source material. Absolutely. And if you'd like to follow what we're doing, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now YouTube. Um, if you want to see Mark read a story, he can redo the face in the courthouse window. That's a lot of fun. Um, and of course, uh, we, we will, you know, because of the pandemic, um, this is a difficult time for the performing arts, and we hope that you will consider donating to Theater Huntsville. You can do that at theaterhsv.org. Um, and upcoming soon will be announcements about our, appropriately, the Ghost Light Society. We'll be looking for inaugural members of the Ghost Light Society to support community theater going forward. And that's about it. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you soon.